Top Med Talk. Nick McGerrison here. This piece is taken from the Perioptive Medicine Special Interest Group's 2018 Annual Conference, Measuring, Managing and Minimising Risk, which was held in association with the Australian and New Zealand Society of Geriatric Medicine and the Internal Medicine Society of Australia and New Zealand. Don't forget to check out the show notes on topmedtalk.com. Next speaker is Dr. Ben Griffiths. He'll be talking about the Enzila QI. He's a consultant anaesthetist at Auckland City Hospital. Ben's interests include major airway anaesthesia and quality improvement for high-risk surgical patients. He is the anaesthetic lead as part of the um, steering group that has helped develop Enzila QI. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Jill, for the kind introduction. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and an honour to be here this afternoon um, and get a chance to update you on what is, I believe, a pretty exciting project for Proptive Medicine and for Australasia. It's also a a privilege and a pleasure to be sharing this this talk with so many uh, Proptive Medicine enthusiasts um, and, as Ross mentioned earlier, one of the largest uh, conferences in the world of its kind. So Anzila QI is the Australia and New Zealand Emergency Laparotomy Audit Quality Improvement. And I can't really go any further without giving special thanks and acknowledgement to certain individuals. Um, I don't have the time to go into the specific contributions that these people have made, but it's fair to say that the talent and the commitment and contribution of all of those people, uh, without which would not have uh, allowed Anzila QI to be in such a good position that it is today. I'd also give special thanks to Jill and James, Uh, sorry, and Jeremy um, and the rest of the uh, the SIG team for once again, like Manly last year, giving us the platform to promote the project. I have no conflict of interest. So the overview then is to first of all give you an update on the project, the background, the structure, the organisation and the support. Uh, Then um, ask ourselves, do we actually need such a project in Australasia? And I'll, I'll give you multiple perspectives on why I believe we do. And then how you join the project and what you'd expect to happen once you do. Before I do that, though, I just want to kind of underscore all of the talks this afternoon uh, and what I'm about to say regarding Anzila. Um, I think all too often, um, as clinicians, probably predicated on a sense of humility, we kind of shrink the value of what we do individually and what we do collectively and what our system does uh, in society. But actually, perioptive emergency care, acute care, it seeks to save life and restore humanity for those who, through severe illness, would otherwise lose both. So I think if we expand it to its fullest remit just for this afternoon, if we allow ourselves to really appreciate what we do, it's existentially important. I think that's really worthwhile remembering today and for the rest of the conference. It's also a very complicated system that we work in, increasingly so. But if it's important, we must surely strive to improve it at all, at all costs. How can you improve something if you don't measure it? And that's what Anzila QI proposes to do for these sorts of high-risk operations and procedures. So when we first started Anzila QI about 15, 16 months ago, in its very sort of infant stages, we learned and borrowed heavily from the leaders of successful projects elsewhere, particularly the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit in the UK and the Emergency Laparotomy Collaborative that Carol's already mentioned. We had to come up with an agreed minimum data set, and we did. We worked really hard on that. We were advised very sternly by um, by the leaders of other projects, you must minimize the data collection burden for individuals in hospitals. So unlike NILA, which had about 120 data points to start with, we got it down to about 60. But despite that, we get all the key performance indicators we want to have for these patients. We also put a few things in that NILA didn't have. For example, we have the antibiotic timing for sepsis. Um, and other things that are pertinent specifically to Australia and New Zealand. So, for example, frailty scoring, we wanted to put in early. Private sector, I'll come on to that in a second. Inter-hospital transfers and days alive and out of hospital at 90 days. Um, 15% of emergency laparotomies in Australia occur in a private institution, unlike the UK where I believe none do. An inter-hospital transfer occurs for these patients in some 20% of occasions, whether it's before surgery or after. And we know there's good data out there to show that those who are transferred have considerably worse outcomes. And then taking those, that data into key performance indicators and feeding it back to clinicians in real time 
to try and facilitate raising the quality of care. This is the totality, if you like, of the minimum data set. So it gives you an idea of the volume of stuff we're going to be collecting. And I put it along the patient journey so you can see where it's going to appear as you go along. So you've got the, um, the admission, the booking, the intraoperative period, the postoperative period, um, some demographic stuff and some outcome stuff there as well. So you can see the sort of size uh, of the project on a local level. We're using for the pilot uh, a um, a web-based uh, program called REDCap, which is a secure program uh, in which we've designed a database for you to insert your data. So clinicians who are registered for Anzila in their localities would log in with a username and password when the patient arrives and begin um, tracking that patient's data as they, as they go through their journey. In practice, what we found from the centres already doing data in Australia is that surgical registrars and fellows typically at the end of the case in theatre will spend about eight minutes putting in all the data that's happened from admission to that point, and then on discharge of the patient, do the rest over a couple more minutes. So it actually doesn't take a lot of time, we've discovered. And then the mortality stuff um, afterwards will be collected in a different way. So there you can see a screenshot of the sort of interface that you'd be using in the hospital on your computer screen to, uh, to insert the Anzila data. The key performance indicators of care process and outcome that we're particularly hoping to capture for these patients are um, a pre-op risk assessment documented, time to antibiotics for sepsis, a CT scan reported, uh, uh, performed and reported preoperatively, arrival into theatre in a time scale uh, appropriate for urgency, <clears throat> consultant surgeon and anaesthetist in theatre where risk of death is greater than 5%, direct admission to critical care where risk of death is greater than 10%, post-operative care of the elderly input, or specialist review, I should say, for patients aged 65 and over, uh, mortality at 30 and 90 days, and at one year, plus days alive and out of hospital at 90 days as an indicator of morbidity. We'll take that data and those KPIs and produce run charts. So these have been very successfully used in NILA and in ELC in the UK. And essentially what you get is your own local data plotted month to month, uh, superimposed on a, an international standard of care. And you can see where you're making improvements, where perhaps things are getting worse, and how you can engage in quality improvement and raising any particular issues. And celebrating where, um, where successes and wins have been achieved as well. In addition, we'll be giving the hospitals these red, amber, green um, charts as well, these RAG charts for KPIs. This is an opportunity to see how you fare to other hospitals, perhaps in your metropolitan or regionally or nationally or even binationally. If you're um, achieving uh, a KPI target of 80% most of the time, you're in the green zone, 50 to 80% the amber zone, below 50% the red zone. And that really highlights where people are having successes and where they're struggling. And where they're struggling, that really opens up the opportunity for shared learning and discovering what other people are doing differently that you might want to introduce into your institution. So it's been shown with these sorts of data and handing it back to the clinicians who are actually delivering care at the front line. You can support shared learning. You can, it enables engagement with clinicians within and across specialties as well as across the country. Levers can be pulled, perhaps for the first time, in terms of resource allocation and development. Business cases can be supported by objective data and examples of success successes elsewhere. And I, I just have to sort of reiterate, really, that, that much of the structure um, and shape of how the project looks, um, it's very much a situation like this. You know, we have a lot of uh, thanks to give for people who've gone before us in other parts of the world and, uh, and done this uh, so successfully. The... <clears throat> Excuse me, the structure of Anzila QI then, um, first and foremost, it's a by college governed or owned project. And that's really important. So, both the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons and the uh, Surgeon New Zealand College of Anesthesia govern this project. It has a terms of reference document which underpins the project's values, a governance committee uh, populated by members of both uh, colleges' council members, a steering committee of committed clinicians who have wide geographical uh, specialty and societal representation. And perhaps one of the most pleasing aspects of all of the project is the funding side of things. It's truly collaborative, probably unprecedented uh, in its nature. Not only did the two colleges um, uh, offer some funding for the pilot, but 
both anaesthesia and surgical sister societies in both Australia and New Zealand also contributed money for the pilot study. In terms of longer term funding, in New Zealand we have applied for three major grant applications uh, and in Australia um, we've been invited and applied for Australian federal funding which we are um, quietly hopeful uh, about and uh, awaiting um, a response. In terms of the, uh, the backing uh, regarding organisations, not surprisingly you've got RAX and ANSCA, you've also got the anaesthesia and surgical societies of both countries. Also, really importantly, because this is uh, a parapetive medicine project after all, we have the College of Emergency Medicine, we have the Intensive Care Colleges of Australia and New Zealand, and we have the uh, Australia and New Zealand Society of Geriatric, Geriatric Medicine as well. Initially, we hoped to get 10 sites for the pilot project of Anzila QI, and we're overwhelmed and delighted by the response we actually got and the enthusiasm. We achieved national ethics in Australia in about 48 hours, thanks to Dr. Ed O'Loughlin, who's a WA anaesthetist in Perth. And I think that's a record for Australia. Um, unfortunately, in Australia, unbeknownst to us at the time, um, site-specific local ethics approval is a good deal more tricky and varies place to place. So the centres on the left are the ones that already have local ethics approval and are participating in data collection. They're actually participating in Anzila QI. And the ones on the right are in the process of getting local ethics and will hopefully at some point soon be also collecting data for the project. The two centres highlighted in red are private institutions. Um, as I said before, 15% of these operations are done in the private hospitals and we'd be keen to get all of those hospitals ultimately involved in the project. And I think you'll agree that the spread across the hospitals really represents all states and territories, as well as metropolitan and rural areas uh, of Australia, which I think, I think that's great. In New Zealand, we have the, a very similar project, a slightly different name, it's called Cadenza, which is the care delivery in New Zealand for the acute abdomen. Um, it is the New Zealand arm of Anzila QI, though, to, uh, there's no doubt about that. But it's slightly different in its um, reach, if you like. It seeks to harness IT opportunities in New Zealand, um, essentially to electronically capture all the clinical information of these patients uh, and automatically extract it uh, into the database for the project. So we would produce a minimum data set in New Zealand for Anzila and report that to, to uh, Australia for binational amalgamation. Um, the hope is to demonstrate the applicability of seamless workflow data capture and therefore the future of, uh, of quality improvement because you completely reduce data collection burden and people can actually be released to focus on quality improvement itself, which is clearly the way forward. Um, because also once you've set it up, it self-perpetuates, it's quite easy once you've got it all locked in, we've expanded the remit of the project to include all acute abdomens and therefore try and capture that elusive denominator, which is the patient who needs an emergency laparotomy, but either the patient refuses or the clinicians deem it too high risk. And they're very hard to capture in the traditional way of audit data capture, but hopefully this way we may have a good chance. And I think it'll be really important to capture those patients for lots of reasons. And I should just add, if there's any Australian hospitals in the audience who have the capacity or are interested in developing their IT to this sort of end, please speak to myself or Dr. Iris Sukin, who's the joint PI of uh, Cadenza uh, at some point during the conference. So do we need Anzila QI? I think probably you'd agree that with the size I've just shown you, the horse is probably already bolted, and I think that's a good thing. But I actually uh, I believe we certainly do need it, and it's a nice opportunity to share and think about this with this sort of audience today. Let's take a step back and look at the Australian perspective. 14,500 emergency laparotomies a year. This produces a significant healthcare burden for this country. It's high cost, it's high risk of death, and survival is often associated with long-term dependence and disability. Uh, according to IPA data, that's the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority, uh, in excess of $400 million per annum is spent looking after these patients. There is no national data in Australia on processes, outcomes, or organisational delivery of services. And recently published local data from WA, thanks to James, demonstrated poor compliance with international standards. Uh, the Grattan Institute is a non-government public health think tank in Australia with quite some influence um, 
I don't know how many of you here are familiar with it. I would very much recommend you read this report. Um, but they're backed by the government. They're backed by major banks and financial institutions, among other, among, other, among other things. And this report in August of this year, entitled Safer Care Saves Money, How to Improve Patient Care and Save Public Money at the Same Time, is really pertinent. If all hospitals, according to the report, lifted their performance to match the best 10% of hospitals, an extra quarter of a million patients would go home complication-free each year. The health system would save about $1.5 billion a year, freeing up beds and resources to allow about another 300,000 patients to be treated. And I think that's quite extraordinary, frankly. It also demonstrates the importance of measuring so that you know what the 10% are and how the others can get up there. They want to say that current national hospital accreditation system has failed, and they cite many examples, but one that particularly stood out for me was that all hospitals, all hospitals that had a significant safety failure in the last 10 or so years, and they were significant safety failures, pass accreditation with flying colours. Instead of compliance and advocates, accreditation would shift to outcomes and quality improvement, transparency and official reporting in the public domain of complications and improvement or lack thereof. So I really feel that what Anzila QI is postulating it can do or is trying to do fits beautifully with this uh, sort of remit. What about the impact of quality improvement projects internationally? Well, as we've heard from, uh, from Professor Carol Peden, several projects have delivered on what I would describe as the Holy Trinity. Lives saved, quality raised, cost reduced. Going back to Neela and the ELC, you're sick of these projects now. On the left-hand side, you've got 30-day mortality. Both projects have reduced that over the three years that they've been running. We're waiting for the uh, fourth annual report of Neela, and if we believe uh, Michael and Carol with a fireworks uh, display, uh, it looks like it's good news. But prior to that, 10% reduction in 30-day mortality and ELC 16%, and also a reduction in average length of stay from both projects. There's also been an almost universal improvement in care processes, um, a cost saving to the NHS of about $44 million a year. And because of all that, the NHS cash strap, cash strap as it must surely be, it's decided to fund the project for five more years. And I understand there's going to be greater engagement in quality improvement methodology through my agency, further improvements down the line. It's really interesting. I think it was touched on earlier, but um, in terms of changes and what you see getting changed, clinical care changes quite rapidly because it's kind of down to individuals, really, and just individual willpower. So things like risk assessment and consultant presence, rapid changes, quite easy. Hospital processes, much slower, sometimes even unchanged. So things like access to the theatre in a timely manner or, uh, or ICU access. This paper was published online earlier this month. It's from the Neela Group. It's looking at um, factors that are associated with a fall in mortality from emergency laparotomy surgery with respect to organization, hospital organizational resource things. So they looked at about 40,000 operations, and they found an odds ratio suggesting improved survival with the presence of an acute surgical unit. It's interesting to hear Professor Michael Cox talking about when he set up a single emergency laparotomy pathway. Almost half of these patients were over 70, and they had a 90-day mortality of 24%. Post-operative geriatric review had an odds ratio of 0.35, and the, the authors commented in, in the conclusion that structures like a pathway or a surgical unit and processes like consultants in theatre and care of the elderly input were associated with improved survival. Indeed, the Association of Surgeons of Great Britain and Ireland are having a laparotomy meeting next month, and a whole third, maybe half of the day, is devoted to frailty and futility. So it's clearly a, just a huge area. Sticking with futile care theme for a moment more, this is quite interesting data that James Aitkins gave me from WA. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are aware, the non-surgeons are aware of the audit of surgical mortality, but my understanding is it's been around in the different states of Australia for at least 15 or so years. And this is interesting data showing the proportion of WA general surgical patients who die without an operation and what you can see is that there's been a steady increase over the years, um, and it's about doubled in the last 15 years, so without an operation. What this surgical mortality audit does is it uh, records and reports on patients who die under the care of a general surgeon. Oops. So we look at this data here comparing NILA with the Perth emergency laparotomy audit. 
first striking thing is obviously the difference in mortality, whether it's 30-day or 90-day. Okay, fine, that, that's pretty interesting. But look at the difference in undertaking high-risk surgery or not. So the Perth group are operating, in terms of operating on pa- patients over 80 years old, they're operating on 25% less. In terms of operating on patients with a perioperative risk of death at 30 days of 10% or more, they're operating on 18% less. Uh, we can't prove it, but there's a strong feeling amongst a number of people, including James Aitken, that the audit of surgical mortality has actually had a positive long-term effect on the amount of futile surgery being undertaken. So how does your hospital join Anzila QI? Well, you can join today, potentially. Um, talk to myself or James or Catherine Economides. Uh, talk to myself or Iris Sukin if you're a New Zealand hospital. Um, I would strongly suggest that getting a local team as a minimum, a motivated surgeon and an anaesthetic consultant level. Um, you'll need at the early stages to get site-specific ethics approval. And we've got an Anzila QI team and a help desk that you can access via the website. They're based in the RACS audit office in Adelaide, and they can take you through these steps. The, um, the website, www.surgeons.org forward slash Anzila QI, will give you all sorts of use of information, including resources such as this, you know, what is the data set, um, what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, getting started on the REDCap database, how you start a record, how you access it afterwards, that sort of thing. Once you join, and you'll be guided through the initial steps, including ethics, once you've put a certain amount of data in there over time, you will get your data back showing key quality indicators. That's going to that's gonna highlight your strengths and weaknesses locally, and that will enable you to educate uh, and engage other members of staff to reward the team where, where victories have happened and help raise as evidence-based standards of care where they need raising. And you belong to an increasing network where benchmarking, healthy competition and learning can occur. We plan to create a social media platform to facilitate news release, uh, support shared learning and grow the network even further. So if you join the project, after a, a couple of months you'll get an interim report. This is an example of uh, Sir Charles Gardner's uh, interim report, um, hospital in Perth. You get a, a, a results report like this. On the left hand side, you've got your key performance indicators, a number of cases. In the middle, you have your run chart showing your progression of hitting those targets over time. And on the right, you've got your red, red amber, green. Um, it's really, it's really important that, that good care, which you can demonstrate with this data, is, is you know, you reward the staff and the, and the team with that. So. Improvement in care process can be a really powerful tool for team building and for giving, instilling a greater sense of value and, 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 and the collective in people's minds. Royal Darwin, um, for example, who've been um, submitting data for a little while now, have and had their data back given to them. They, for example, one of the changes they've made is they've made it mandatory that a preoperative risk assessment is done. You cannot book a laparotomy until that is done, and that's a change they've made based on their data. Fiona Stanley are looking at incorporating it into the electronic theatre booking form, again, making it a mandatory field. Um, and of course, annual reports of this nature can be generated for hospitals, for clinicians, for administrators, state and territory level, as well as government. And it creates a level of transparency to each other, as well as the government and the public. And the, public. the more data you're putting in over time, of course, the, the more enriched the, uh, the run charts become, and the more useful they are to you in your locality. So to close, I believe this is a project we can all get behind. But I actually go a step further. I actually think we need this project. As individual clinicians, in our department, the interspecialty dynamics and team working, the creation of metropolitan, regional, and national networks for perioperative medicine going forwards, for responsible stewardship of healthcare and its resources going forward. I think that's really important. And last but not least, of course, for our patients. Anzila QI is not just a quality improvement project, it's a quality improvement movement. On behalf of James Aiken, myself, and the steering group, we'd be delighted if you joined us today. Thank you. Dean Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. 
join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.